and, and understanding of our judiciary system. It's just uh, kind of once in a lifetime type opportunity uh, for us to have. And I know students, some of you think, ah, oh, what is this? Uh, but I guarantee you, uh, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, you're going to look back and you're going to talk about this event that happened at our high school because it is that special of an event. And something like this just doesn't occur uh, just overnight. It takes a lot of organizing and, and planning. Uh, Lisa Finney and her staff, I'd really like to thank them. They work directly uh, with uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, they've been traveling up here. They've been talking to us to make sure this event uh, goes very well. So thanks to them. Uh, Lynn Jentz is here. I would like to thank her. Uh, we had a great dinner with our Minnesota Supreme Court last night. She coordinated that as well. And then also a nice shout out to our social studies teachers who uh, prepared you for today's uh, event. So thank you. All right, so we're going to get things started. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask everyone to please rise for the presentation of our colors. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Students, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Judge Ann Carrot of the Seventh Judicial District. Um, she is the person who is very instrumental in bringing this event to us today. She's been advocating for our community, our high school, to have this here for, for many years. So uh, it's just a great pleasure, and we're very thankful for all the work that she's done. Uh, Judge Carrot has served on the Minnesota District Court bench since 2007. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin, and her Juris Doctorate from Hamlin University School of Law. Prior to her tenure on the District Court bench, she worked in private practice at a law firm here in Alexandria. Before that, she served as the Douglas County Attorney and as Assistant Morrison County Attorney. Judge Carrot, again, was instrumental in persuading the Supreme Court to visit Alexandria High School. So I'm especially grateful and pleased that she will be our special MC for this program. Please help me welcome Judge Carrot. Thank you. Um, as uh, Principal Dewenhager said, this is a great opportunity for you. So I um, hope that you have questions when we're done and we'll get to that after the argument. Thank you again to the faculty, the school board, court staff, and uh, the students for joining us here today in the Performing Arts Center. Also, uh, thank you to a special welcome to those who are watching live on the broadcast from Air Alexandria Area Schools. Um, you've been studying the court system, I know that. A couple of things that the justices would like me to make sure you know is that our court system is 150 years old, older than the state of Minnesota. Uh, there are 10 districts in our, count, in our state. Um, I work in the 7th district, which includes Alexandria. Um, these districts are the triage sort of courts who handle everything from speeding tickets to murder cases to adoptions to divorces. 
The second level is the Court of Appeals, 19 judges hearing any appeals from decisions I and other district courts make. Then there's the Supreme Court, who you will see today, seven people on that court, um, and you will have an opportunity to hear an argument with them today. In last year, Minnesota courts handled 1.3 million cases, um, and the Supreme Court decides about 150 cases a year, so it sort of dwindles as you go up the, the ladder, so to speak. The Supreme Court hears appeals from uh, district court, tax court, workers' compensation, courts of appeals, and all first-degree murder cases are automatically appealed to the Supreme Court. Um, they also hear any election arguments or cases. The case you are going to hear today is State of Minnesota versus Eric John Heinenen. In this case, Respondent, State of Minnesota, charged the appellant, Eric Heinenen, with possession of a firearm by an ineligible person. Before trial, Heinenen moved to suppress the firearm, arguing the police failed to scrupulously honor his assertion of his right to remain silent. When, two or three hours later, an officer asked him if he would consent to a DNA test. The district court denied the motion to suppress, Following a jury trial, Heinenen was convicted of the charged offense, and the district court imposed a presumptive sentence. The Court of Appeals affirmed, on appeal to the Supreme Court, the issue is whether the police failed to scrupulously honor Heinenen's assertion of his right to remain silent. This case was originally heard in Sherburne County. In K, uh, this is a real case. It's a very important matter that is going to be decided today by the justices, and it is critical that the justices and the attorneys presenting their cases not be distracted. Um, so we are going to require that you comply with all rules as if you were in a courtroom building. That includes if you have a cell phone on you, they should be turned off. Um, any activity that distracts the court will be a basis for removal from the Performing Arts Center. Keep in mind that the total time for the arguments is about an hour, and you will be giving uh, time after that to get up and move around before we get to the question and answer segment. It's now my privilege to uh, have the justices convene court here in the Performing Arts Center. The justices are getting um, prepared. They'll be out here in just a few minutes, so please be patient.
Good morning, please be seated. We have one case for argument this morning, Eric John Hainanen versus the State of Minnesota. Mr. Butler, you've reserved five minutes for rebuttal. Yes, sir. You may proceed when you're ready. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Benjamin Butler. I'm an assistant state public defender and I represent the appellant Eric Hainanen. The police do not scrupulously honor an individual's exercise of his Fifth Amendment right to remain silent when they, in response to that invocation, ask the arrestee for consent to provide a DNA sample to investigate the crime of arrest. That's what happened here and this court must therefore overturn Mr. Hainanen's conviction and remand for a new trial without the DNA evidence and without his statements about the DNA evidence. The Fifth Amendment, of course, protects the right of an arrested person to remain silent, and Mr. Hainanen unequivocally invoked that right. <clears throat> when a person invokes the right to remain silent, the person tells the police to leave him alone. He tells the police that he does not want to participate in the investigation of the crime of arrest. He does not want to help the police. He does not even want to try to help himself. He doesn't want to try to exculpate himself, and he doesn't want to do anything that could inculpate himself. That is what the invocation of the right to silence means. Because that right is so important, the United States Supreme Court has held that it must be, quote, scrupulously honored by police before they can talk to an individual again. Whether the invocation of the right to silence is scrupulously honored is a fact-intensive question and is decided on a case-by-case -case basis. This court has never decided whether asking a suspect or an arrestee to provide a DNA sample is scrupulously honoring the right to remain silent, and therefore this is a question of first impression. Counsel, question. I wanted to ask you if, if we were to change the facts slightly and suppose that the police would have had a warrant for the DNA sample. And I know you discussed this in the brief and had gone in and asked for the DNA swab, but the, he then asked, what are you doing? And, or they said, we're taking a DNA swab. And then he made the statement he made here, which is, well, why are you doing this? Well, we're doing it to, you know, to, to match it with a shotgun. Would you be making the same argument? Or is the key here to your argument the fact that there wasn't a warrant at all for the taking of the evidence? The key to my argument, Your Honor, for the DNA sample itself is that there was no warrant. I think if that had happened, we may still have an argument about his statement, that it was that how I handled the gun, uh, given that he had already invoked his right to silence. But that would be a much harder case, I think, for the defense to make. Well, and here's, here's my problem with it. Um, take a slightly different situation, although the DNA swab works well, but suppose they needed to take fingernail clippings. And I, I think that your rule may, for someone who's uh, invoke the right to remain silent may force police officers to come in, not speak to the defendant, and say, you know, give me your hands or, or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Just grab the defendant's hands mm -hmm. and do the fingernail clippings. And I don't know if that's a great rule either. And so, I mean, I guess I, what is, what is the scope of the rule here? I mean, can, can sure. police not talk to the defendant before they take, uh, before they take items? No, Your Honor, that's not the, the scope of the rule that we're, uh, we're asking for. Again, this is a fact-intensive inquiry. And so if the police in your hypothetical walked into the defendant and said, look, Mr. Hainanen, um, I know that you've invoked your right to silence, 
uh, and we're not going to talk to you about the case at all. Uh, we're not going to ask you any questions about it. We honor your invocation of your constitutional right. But we also have the right to, without a warrant, take a fingernail clipping or swab for gunshot residue or whatever. Or we have a warrant uh, to take a DNA sample. In that case, there may not be a Fifth Amendment violation because in that hypothetical, uh, if you go back to, for example, the, the Mosley case, one of the things that Mosley talks about is re-Mirandizing the defendant. If you re-Mirandize the arrestee before you talk to him, there's probably no problem. What's if you do something short of re-Mirandizing him, like even uh, reminding him that you know that he's invoked his right to silence, there might not be a problem. What's the authority, though? Is, is there authority for the fact that before uh, evidence is taken from a suspect um, that you need to have another Miranda warning given? I mean, are there cases that actually hold that? There are cases that hold, Your Honor, that, well, let me back up a minute. This is sort of a unique context because most of the cases involving taking physical evidence don't involve a suspect who has also invoked his right to silence. And so in a lot of the cases, this issue just doesn't come up. They are not Mosley cases. They're Fourth Amendment cases. Some of them are pre-Miranda cases, as in do you need to Mirandize a suspect first? Once the suspect invokes his right, is Mirandized properly, and properly invokes his right to silence, it takes the, a case like this and puts it into a different box. And the box it puts it into is, is the police action scrupulously honoring the suspect's invocation of the right to silence. And counsel, does passage of time matter in that analysis? It does, Your Honor. And in and this instance, wasn't it about three hours? Uh, the district court's finding, Your Honor, is that it was two to three hours later. And the officer's testimony, the officer's first testimony was that it was not two hours later, as in less than two hours later. He then corrected himself and said it was two to three hours later. So I think we can, we can assume that it's between two and three hours. Now, that seems like a long time. I'm only going to be up here for 30 minutes. That seems like a long time to me, too. But it's not that long a time in the context of what we're talking about. Um, Mr. Hainanen was just arrested for a serious felony crime carrying a five-year mandatory prison sentence if he's, if he's guilty of it, possession of a firearm by an ineligible person. Uh, this is, as far as we know, as far as the record shows, the first interactions he has with the investigating officers at the police station after his invocation is this. Presumably he was booked and he talked to some jailers. But one of the other things that's important is that it is the same officer to whom Mr. Hainanen has already said, I don't want to talk to you, is back there two to three hours later, talking to him about the offense of arrest. Counsel, Counsel why is collecting a DNA sample test, I mean, it first has to be testimonial before the Fifth Amendment is even at issue. So why is collecting a DNA sample testimonial? Your Honor, the, the, I'm going to take issue a little bit with the premise of your question. Um, what has to happen is that the police have to scrupulously honor the, invo the invocation of the right to silence. And when the police come to the defendant and say, will you, give us a, will you give us a DNA sample, they're asking him a question that he has to answer yes so or no. So are you saying that even if, even if what they're asking for is not testimonial, that there's still a violation of the Fifth Amendment? Yes. In this case, Your Honor, there is. Because the police are putting all of their energies on the defendant. There is no warrant, like in, in Justice Strauss's hypotheticals, no neutral and detached magistrate has stood between law enforcement and the defendant. What case law supports the proposition that if what you're asking for is not testimonial, mm -hmm. it nevertheless violates the Fifth Amendment? There, there are several cases, Your Honor, cited in our briefs um, where this issue has been raised in other jurisdictions. This court has never considered it. But there, and the majority rule certainly is that there is no Fifth Amendment violation. I don't, want to, I don't want to downplay that. That's certainly the majority position. But it's not the exclusive position. And counsel, let me ask you about that because numerous federal courts and state courts have said in this situation it's not interrogation. Doesn't that give us an idea what reasonable people think, that it's not likely to elicit incriminating response? Uh, with all due respect to those courts, Your Honor, I think if you look at those opinions, you will find the analysis is somewhat wanting. Um, most of those courts, there seems to be a wave that started in the 1980s of saying this isn't a Fifth Amendment violation, and then everyone just builds on the last one. And, the most, and, and so all the federal courts that look at it, especially recently, say, well, boy, everybody else says this isn't a Fifth Amendment violation, so but, we don't really need to think about it. But, counsel, here, here's my issue with it. Miranda was designed to 
uh, prevent psychological ploys by the police officers. And they were doing some really horrific things, if you read the, the Miranda opinion. Um, and I just don't see how a simple uh, request that is a yes or no answer can be thought of to be a psychological ploy. No, I don't, I don't know that it is a psychological ploy, Your Honor, but I also think that's a really limited view of what Miranda is designed to protect. For example, if the police came back to Mr. Heinonen and said, uh, just started talking to him again, <coughs> excuse me, just started saying, hey, let's talk about the offense without re-Mirandizing him, that would be a Miranda violation and a Fifth Amendment violation, but there's no psychological ploy there. They're being very upfront about what they're doing. Well, but th that's a case where they're clearly not honoring the, the request for silence because they're coming back and asking him about the case. It's sure. like he had never said anything. And I think that's, a, that's my point exactly, Your Honor. It's like he had never said anything. And that's true here, too. He has told them to leave him alone. He doesn't want to help them investigate the case. He doesn't want to try to help himself or so, exercise himself. But if that's himself. the case, why doesn't he just say no? Because he shouldn't, Your Honor, be put in that position. Counsel, let me test what the limit of that proposition is and give you a hypothetical. One night, police arrest a guy named Jim for killing his friend Sam. The next morning, the same police investigator is walking down the jail hallway and sees Jim and says, hey, Jim, how are you doing today? And Jim says, I had a terrible night. I feel so guilty for killing my friend Sam. Mm -hmm. How about that question, how are you doing today? Mm -hmm. Is that a second interrogation? I think it's probably not, Your Honor, because it is not a statement that is reasonably likely to elicit an incriminating response. It is not a question about the crime of arrest. Now, if the police officer said to Jim, hey, Jim, how are you doing given that you just killed Sam last night? That, I think, would be interrogation because it is a question directly related to the offense of arrest. And if the police officer said, hey, Jim, uh, would you give me a DNA sample so I can match it up to the gun that was used to kill Sam, that would be interrogation, and that's what we have here. So the closer you get but to the- Counsel, if I may, you, you, you keep using the phrase connected to the offense of arrest. And I'm wondering, I, I know why you say that, but I'm wondering if any cases actually make that connection. Because it seems to me here, the answer to the question that was posed to your client, as Justice Chudich indicated, could have been answered yes or no. And that's why I think most courts have said this is not um, interrogation, because it's not likely to produce an incriminating response. The answer is yes or no. But, but you also seem to be hooking on this idea of related to the offense of arrest. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, if, if any cases actually make that connection. I, don't, I can't point you to a case, Your Honor. The reason I'm, and I, I think you, you know, noted, the reason I'm hooking on to that is because that's what separates this inquiry from the sort of routine biographical inquiries that are given to arrested people who invoke their right to silence all the time. You know, he's not asked, how are you doing today? He's not asked, do you want a ham sandwich for lunch? He's not asked, do you want a cellmate or do you want your own cell? Those are the kind of questions that are inherent to custody. And what Miranda and the Fifth Amendment cases say is that, I agree, that something has to happen beyond that normally inherent to custody. We can't, we're not going to try to stop people from stupidly blurting out incriminating statements in response to routine questions. The request to take a DNA sample when made in connection with the offense is not a question that is routinely inherent in custody. There's nothing in this record that suggests that every person taken to the Sherburne County Jail um, is asked for a DNA sample just because um, they've been placed in custody. And that's, of course, not what the officers were doing. They were doing it because they thought there was DNA on the gun. Counsel, I would agree with you. It's not a routine question. It's not like what's your name, when were you born, you know, those kinds of questions that we typically think of. But doesn't the, do, don't you still have to have the testimonial component? You do have to have some sort of something by the declarant, by the defendant. And when you ask him, would you give us a DNA sample, that is exactly what you're doing. You're asking him a question. He has to use the process of his mind to say, yes, I will, or no, I won't. And while it seems like an innocuous question, he has al I think you, you can't divorce this from the fact that he has already told the police no. He's essentially already answered the question by saying, no, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to participate in this. So, counsel, will we have a different scenario if the police walked in and they 
had the swab in hand and they just said open up and shove the swab in there and then he, he asked them what for and let's say the rest of it plays out the same. Is that a different scenario and if so, tell me why. It, it's a slightly different scenario, Your Honor, at least as far as the DNA sample goes because the DNA, there probably is no communicative aspect in just forcing a DNA sample out of him. Um, but if they do it in a way that is designed to make him talk and then we get into the difference between the DNA sample and the statement, um, there might be an argument that the statement itself is the product of interrogation. Did the but that's, that's not what happened here. Did the, did the police need his consent to take the DNA? Well, they, yes, because they didn't have a warrant uh, and they didn't have any other basis to get it at the time. So the only way they could have gotten it at the time they got it was to get his consent. They're, they're, if the police had gone out and gotten a warrant, this would be a different case. If no, the isn't, net, isn't the net effect of the rule that you're proposing today that you can never, after somebody invokes their right to remain silent, they lose their right to give consent or not give consent to a police procedure. So for example, somebody gets, gets arrested for drunk driving and they immediately invoke their, their right to remain silent. Can the officer then legally say to the suspect, would you consent to a blood test? Mm -hmm. I, the, I'm going to answer your general question first and then your, your specific question, Your Honor, if I may. The general answer to the general question is no. The police do not lose, their person doesn't lose his right automatically and forever to consent to a DNA sample once he invokes his right to silence. If the officers in this case had come to Mr. Hainanen, reminded him that he'd invoked his right to silence, told him they would be willing to honor that, or re-Mirandized him, and then asked him for consent, fine. That's Mosley. And we don't have any problem with that. Now, that's not what happened here. As far as the, the driving example goes, um, the US Supreme Court seems to, at least in dicta, have carved out a sui generis exception for driving tests. Um, so I think under Opperman, that would probably be OK. But that's not this. One of the things the US Supreme Court looks at in those driving cases is a, uh, that that question is asked to everybody uh, who's arrested for DWI. It is part of a standardized question and answer session in Minnesota. That script is, is um, enacted by the state legislature. The officer has to follow it. And so there's something different, the Supreme Court says, about that question than maybe Count, about some other counsel, ones. Counsel, if I may, in, in answer to the, your, your first part uh, of your answer to Justice Lillehaug, does it matter what the consent form says or that, in fact, there is actually a form? Because mm -hmm. it wasn't that they just came and said, will you consent to this? As I, as I recall, the form was fairly extensive, extensive in the sense that, importantly, it told him, you don't have to do this. So I'm not suggesting that it's a, a, a formal substitute for Miranda, but the form told him what his rights were sounds like, as I recall from the transcript, he read that and he signed that. Mm -hmm. But does that make any difference in your analysis? It probably makes a difference, but it's not dispositive, Your Honor. The form tells him he can, he can decline to consent. I agree with that. The form does not say anything about his right to remain silent, doesn't say anything about the fact that the evidence can be used against him, doesn't say anything about anything about his Miranda rights. And so the form, it's probably better that they had a form. I'd have an easier case if they didn't. Um, and if the form had said, uh, uh, we know that you've invoked your right to silence, we know that we're reminding you of that, and you have a right to an attorney, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that would, that would probably go a long way towards saying that this was uh, not a Fifth Amendment violation. But this form doesn't do that. And I think for that reason, the state in its brief to this court doesn't rely on the form at all. Um, as, a, as an argument for why this was valid. Counsel, turning to the DNA sample itself, under Schmerber it seems, and, and some courts have found that that just isn't testimonial. That's mm -hmm. just physical evidence. Yep. And it goes for later analysis, and it could be incriminating, or it could actually show that your client didn't touch that gun. Mm -hmm. The fact that the DNA sample could be... Um, exculpatory, Your Honor, I think doesn't matter at all. Because that's true of any interaction between the police and the, and the defendant. Any time the police come back to a defendant who's invoked his right to silence or to counsel, he could make a statement or do something that helps him, but, or not. But it doesn't, it doesn't change the inquiry. No, but why is it testimonial when other cases with the blood taken from a defendant, fingernail clippings, yeah. voice exemplars, none of that 
and that seems pretty similar to DNA, um, that that's not considered testimonial. I think most of those cases, Your Honor, don't involve the issue we have here which is, did the police scrupulously honor the defendant's right to remain, invocation of his right to remain silent? All of those cases are compulsion cases, and in almost all of them, there is a warrant or a court order standing between the arrested person and law enforcement. Here, there is no warrant or court order. They are asking the suspect. That's communicative. Will you give us a sample? That is an express question. There's no way to say that's not an express question because that's exactly what it is. And he has to give an answer, either but verbal or otherwise. But it's got to be otherwise. an express question that's likely to elicit an incriminating response. Well, if Under I Under you know, and I know you think that that's dicta, but I mean, that was a pretty extensive discussion by our court of, uh, you know, what is an interrogation. Yeah. I mean, in Innis, Innis doesn't say that, Your Honor. Innis doesn't say express well, question it, likely to Innis, elicit. Innis has language that can be interpreted a couple of ways, and our court has said express questioning has to be reasonably likely to elicit an incriminating response. Okay, so let's, let's leave, let's say Tibiowski, however you pronounce that word, let's say that's, that's good law and it's not dicta and, and you should follow it. Um, I would submit that that question is reasonably likely to elicit an incriminating response, particularly from a defendant who has already said, I don't want to talk to you. Because the reasonable defendant is going to do one of two things. He's either going to know that they're looking to test the DNA against the DNA on the gun, and he's going to try to say something to help himself, or he's going to do what Mr. Hananen did is, and, and wonder why, and talk about why do you need this, and start engaging the officers in this kind of discussion about the offense. And that is communication. And the fruit of that communication is the DNA. And the US Supreme Court has <clears throat> repeatedly made clear that physical evidence derived from a compelled statement is suppressed as a result of a Fifth Amendment violation. The Fifth Amendment is not just concerned with actual talking. Counsel, it seems like we're then back to Justice Lillehog's point, which is that once the Miranda rights have been read and invoked, that the police cannot ask any of those subsequent questions uh, akin to what Justice Lillehag had pointed out. I, I think that's not true, Your Honor. I think if the police came back to the suspect and re-Mirandized him, or even short of re-Mirandized him, reminded him that they know that he's already invoked his right to silence, but they want to do this one thing, we have a completely different case on our hands. But that gets me back to my first set of questions, which is, um, what's the authority for requiring re-Mirandizing when you want to obtain physical evidence from someone? And I don't know that you actually gave me the authority, if there is some. Sure. The, the authority, Your Honor, is Mosley. Mosley is the authority for the proposition that once a suspect has invoked his right to silence, in order to talk to him some more, the police, the police have to scrupulously honor his invocation of his right to silence. Before they can talk to him, they have to, I mean, Mosley doesn't say as a bright line rule, you must read Miranda. But that's the, that was the big fact in Mosley that led the Supreme Court to say there was no problem because it was a different officer talking to him about a different case um, and they had re-Mirandized him. But that wasn't a physical evidence case. That was, where, that was where they came in and a different officer, it was a completely different case. There's nothing about asking for physical evidence, correct? I agree, there wasn't. But it's still communication. When you come back and ask him for physical evidence, that's as much communication as coming back and asking him to talk. You're still communicating with him on the front end. So all the, all the hypotheticals about what if we came in and just extracted the evidence from him, that's not this case because that's not what happened. There was a communication before the extraction so there's a communication between the, the officer and the defendant, and it's a coercive one. So just, just to kind of close the loop, I mean, really what you're telling me is you, you're, the best you have is to argue by analogy, that there are no cases that say you have to re-Mirandize re um, before you ask for physical evidence. That at most, there's, there's analogies you can make for Mosley and other cases. Well, that's not quite true, Your Honor. Okay. There, there are a few cases cited in the, in the briefs a uh, couple of federal courts in New York and an intermediate appellate court in Arizona that has held that in this exact situation, um, there's been a Mosley violation or a Fifth Amendment violation uh, where a request for consent to produce physical evidence was, uh, was made 
and the defendant then gave up the physical evidence. So there are some cases. Um, there's no case from the U.S. Supreme Court because they've never decided this. There's no case from this court because you've never decided it. That's why it's a question of first impression. Um, it is important to note that there is only the most artificial of distinctions between a question, is this your gun, and a question, can we take your DNA to determine whether this is your gun? And we lawyers can parse out the differences between those, but the suspect doesn't. And when we look to see whether the suspect is interrogated or whether his right to silence has been vindicated or scrupulously honored, courts look at that through the eyes of the suspect. Counsel, why does it make sense if the police could have just come in and stuck a Q-tip in and taken a DNA swab without any conversation at all, and then they can use those test results? Why does it make sense that here, when they give your client a, a chance to object to it, that they can't use those DNA results? Why does that rule make sense? Well, Your Honor, they, they couldn't have, not without a warrant. They couldn't have just come in and stuck a Q-tip in his mouth and taken a DNA sample. That's a search. And that would be a warrantless search, and they would need to get a warrant before they could do that. So it's not like uh, hand swabbing or something else. Specifically with regard to DNA, they couldn't have done that. Now, if they got a warrant and did it, it's a totally different case. But that's the point of the warrant, and that's the point of going and getting um, a neutral and detached magistrate to ensure that law enforcement is following the prescripts of the Constitution. In, in a usual booking context, fingerprints are taken. True. So if fingerprints are taken after uh, a defendant has invoked his right to remain silent, then what? Then there's no problem. Because they don't, the police don't ask? Police don't ask. They just, they just do it? Yes. And so then, fine. Then let's use that hypothetical. Why okay. does that make sense, <laughs> that you can use the results of the fingerprints when you don't give the defendant a choice, but when you do give the defendant a choice, you, you can't use the test results? Why does that make sense? Because, Your Honor, the, the, once the Supreme Court decides that taking fingerprints is, is a reasonable search, that removes the Fourth Amendment from the inquiry. You're not talking to him, so that removes the Fifth Amendment from the inquiry. If the police ask the defendant, did you do it, that's a question. If the police go out and, and investigate whether the defendant did it and gather evidence that he did it, that's no problem. There's no Fifth Amendment problem. The fact that they're talking to the defendant makes all the difference in the world. That's why we have a Fifth Amendment problem. Um, there, there we go. Uh, in the chief's hypothetical, suppose they had said to him, give me your index finger, you know, or give me your middle finger, whatever, and we had a situation like this, mm -hmm. because they, he wasn't, they didn't want to grab his hand. Right. Um, and then he says, well, why do you need my fingers? So we can take fingerprints. Mm -hmm. Why do you need my fingerprints? Because there were fingerprints left at the scene. Yeah. Fifth Amendment violation? Maybe, maybe not. I think it probably really depends on the circumstances. Probably not, because that is such a routine part of booking. Um, it's probably not a Fifth Amendment violation, but this sort of inquiry um, by the, you know, remember, this isn't by the jailer. This isn't by somebody connected with the jail. This is by the lead investigator who has just pulled the defendant out of a house, uh, questioned him in the house, handcuffed him in the house, pulled a shotgun out of the house, arrested him, Mirandized him in the police car, asked him to talk about what they're there to talk about, which I think is actually drugs. Um, or the gun. So it makes a difference. So it makes a difference who is doing the um, alleged interrogation. So try this one on for size. Suspect comes in and is booked, invokes his right to remain silent. Fingerprints are taken, but one print didn't turn out very well, and it turns out that's the print the investigator needs. So the investigator goes in the jail and says, "Will you consent to give me another print of your index finger?" Does that violate Miranda? I think that's a lot closer to what we have here, and that might violate Miranda, Your Honor. Yes. I don't know that it does or it doesn't, but it's a lot closer to this. And the answer to your first question is... So it depends is, on the person and it depends on the exact time of when the fingerprint is taken? Yes, Your Honor, and that's what Mosley says. It, how's, how are the cops supposed to figure out that kind of rule? The cops can figure out, since 1975, the cops have been living with the rule that says once a uh, suspect invokes his right to remain silent, you must scrupulously honor that, whatever that means. And there is no solid definition of what scrupulously honors means. The U.S. Well, Supreme Court well, Mosley, has never given us one. Mosley gave us a good idea. It says, where the police failed to honor a decision of a person in custody to cut off questioning, either by refusing to discontinue the interrogation upon request 
whereby persisting in repeated efforts to wear down his resistance and make him change his mind. Sure. And I just don't, I don't know if that second part is, is uh, met here, repeated uh, efforts to wear down his resistance. They went to him and said, will you give us a sample? Well, look at back to the, the Weiberg case that this court decided in 1980. Weiberg's arrested in her house. She invokes her right to silence. The policeman comes out of the bedroom right there in her house and says, hey, is this your purse? And she says, yeah, that's my purse. And the purse has drugs in it. This court held that that was a Miranda violation. Now, there's no trickery there. There's no repeated efforts to wear anything down. There's no anything. But this court held that because of the coercive environment, now, Weiberg's in her own house, but because of the coercive environment being arrested for a uh, felony crime um, and the fact that the police asked her the question um, after she'd invoked her right to silence, that was a Fifth Amendment violation. Now, this environment's a lot more coercive than the environment in Weiberg. My client's in the jail. And he's in the jail on a crime for which he can go to prison for five years on that, on that arresting. He has already told the police he doesn't want to talk to them. And here is the lead investigator back talking to him again. That conveys to Mr. Mr. Hainanen that they're not listening to him. That he may as well just say yes because they're going to keep coming back anyway because he's already told them to leave him alone and they're not doing it. And that's a Fifth Amendment violation. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Counsel. You have five minutes for rebuttal. Mr. Syme. Thank you. May it please the Court, Counsel. My name is Tim Syme. I'm an assistant Sherburne County attorney. I appear here on behalf of the state of Minnesota, the respondent in this matter. I want to begin by talking about what this case is and is not about in the context of appellant's issue. The claim that law enforcement fails to scrupulously honor the invocation of the right to remain silent typically manifests itself in one of two ways, as Justice Church uh, mentioned from Mosley. One is that law enforcement simply ignores the request and continues to interrogate the individual, and one is where they impose pressure on the individual in an attempt to get, their, get the uh, person to change their mind. That's not this case. There is no indication in the record that the request for a DNA sample was designed to do anything other than obtain the DNA. There is no indication in the record that this was uh, essentially a ruse designed to get the individual, the appellant, to change their mind that, to talk about the, the case. That's not the standard, though, right? We're, we're not looking at the motives of the police. We're looking at whether a, a reasonable person in the defendant's shoes would consider this, would, would, we would, we look at whether it would be reasonably likely to in, elicit an incriminating response from the defendant's position, not from what the police intended. Correct. That's the interrogation question. So the question really is, was the request to obtain a consent for a search for physical evidence, which is what the U.S. Supreme Court defines a request for DNA, uh, defined that in Maryland v. King, uh, a search for physical evidence, is that interrogation for purposes of Miranda? That's this case. The police had said to him, we found a gun in the room that you were in. We think it's yours. Will you consent to a DNA test? Do we then have a second interrogation? I, I think, so I would go back to this court's test in Tibiatowski, which is to determine interrogation, you first look at whether the law enforcement officer initiated the conversation, and second, whether the question was reasonably likely to elicit incriminating uh, response. So we have to look at the totality of the circumstances. In and the that an, case, the answer is? The, the, well, the answer is going to depend, I think, on what else is happening in the context. But if the point of the question is to say, we think this is yours, uh, if that part of it is designed to get the uh, individual to waive their right to silence, then yes, that's a different case. And the, an and the answer but, to the question is yes? The answer to the question in, from the respondent's standpoint? I'm, no, the hypothetical, I changed the facts just slightly. Does that change it, the result of this case? I'm, I'm, if it's just, we think 
you, uh, your gun, your fingerprints are on this, your DNA is on this. I'm not sure it changes this case in that hypothetical. Isn't it much more likely that the defendant's going to say, no, wait a minute, I wasn't in that room, and by the way, if you found a gun, it's not mine, and so you're not going to find my fingerprints on it. Or, alternatively, wow, it looks like you got me. Except that um, in that case, I, you'd have to look at the context of what else is going on in the case, I think. Same, I don't know same that things going on in the case in the, as in our real case before us. I've just changed one fact, exactly what the police said. Does that change the result of the case? It certainly could. It certainly could. It could I, or does? I, it could. It could. I don't know that I can say it absolutely does because I don't know in that hypothetical that the purpose of that is designed to elicit incriminating information. If that's the said, we don't look to the purpose, we look to the reasonable likely effect on the, re on the defendant. Correct. We look at it from the defendant's point of view. So is that statement likely to elicit an incriminating response from the defendant? In this case, I don't think it would, but it certainly could. Counsel, I, I, I'm not sure we even need to go as far as Justice Lillehog's uh, hypothetical. It, it, it seems to me that if you go in and you, you ask uh, Mr. Heinen, and, uh, we, you know, can we take your DNA, I'm not sure it's all that far-fetched, and I think uh, Mr. Butler makes this argument in his brief to expect that someone's going to say, why? I mean, that's, that's just a logical question to, to ask. Why do you want to take my DNA? Which, in all likelihood, will then lead to more questions or lead to exactly what happened here. He, Mr. Heinen says, well, I, he starts talking, as defendants often do. Um, I touch the gun. I, I think, just Hudson, there's a two-part answer to that question, if I can back up just a little bit. So the initial question is, may we take your DNA? That is not interrogation because it doesn't ask the defendant to incriminate themselves. The simple yes or no answer, as courts throughout the country have found, does not ask the person to incriminate themselves. Miranda itself says that the Fifth Amendment doesn't cover all conversations between law enforcement and a defendant. It simply says you can't interrogate once the uh, right to silence has been invoked. So the question there is really, is it interrogation? That question is not interrogation. So there's no violation with that question. Now, the follow-up question. Where does it come in then, this idea of scrupulously honoring the invocation to, to remain silent? How does that fit into the analysis that you're just giving me? Again, the question is, in a case like this, is it interrogation? So we know that um, police law We have to always come back to that fundamental question. We always have to come back to that. Like I say, it comes up in, in two different ways. One is the law enforcement, after the invocation of the right to silence is invoked, law enforcement continue, continues to persist and continues to ask interrogating questions. That's the Weiberg case that counsel mentioned. I don't want to speak about this case. Is this your handbag? That's an that question calls for an incriminating response. The, I don't want to speak about this case. Well, will you consent to a search for DNA? May I take your fingerprint? May I search your car? May I search your home? That calls for a yes or no Counsel, answer. why not, as Mr. Butler suggests, if looking at Mosley, why not just simply because this case is, is close, it seems to me, why not simply re-Mirandize it? Uh, how difficult would that be for officers to have done that, to simply say, you know, it's only been a couple hours, we know you invoked your right to silence before, here's what we want to do now, remember that you still have that right to remain silent. I think, as Amicus points out in this case, that creates a difficult rule. We have a fairly bright line rule now. It is sometimes difficult to uh, apply in real life, but custodial interrogation is not permitted. Uh, without the Miranda warnings being given. Now in this case, we're moving beyond interrogation under that hypothetical rule to say when you execute a search or when you request consent, now we're in the Fourth Amendment, we're going to require Miranda for purposes of a Fourth Amendment approach. And that's really what this was. This wasn't a Fifth Amendment approach, it was a Fourth Amendment approach. They're asking simply for consent to search for physical evidence. Counsel, what do you say to um, um, Hainan's counsel's um, 
<clears throat> assertion that it's different when you're asking for a DNA sample because you're at, you're helping the police to investigate the the exact crime of arrest. I don't think there is case law that supports that proposition for several reasons. Number one, DNA itself, what we're talking about here is really just identification. DNA in this sense is no different than the fingerprint. It's no different from the handwriting exemplar. It's no different from asking a defendant to try on a piece of clothing and so on. This is simply identifying information. So. It's not out of the ordinary to request uh, a DNA sample. Second of all, um, with regard to um, the request itself, there is nothing about obtaining that physical evidence that implicates the Fifth Amendment. And the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court has been fairly clear on that in cases such as Fisher, where you can be compelled to provide physical evidence without violating the Fifth Amendment. Counsel, the case law is overwhelmingly in favor of the state here. There are many federal cases and quite a few state cases as well that seem to hold that consent to search is not an interrogation. But isn't the very volume of those cases, the fact there are so many of them, tell us that it is in fact reasonably likely when the police request a consent to search that the suspect is going to say something incriminating? I mean, doesn't the weight of case law actually sort of work against your position? I don't think so, because I think it's important to put, if we bring it back to our scenario here, it's important to put it into context. So there are two, as I understand the appellant's position, there are two actions that are being complained of. One is the direct question, will you consent to, D to a, a DNA swab? The case law is clear and I think the U.S. Supreme Court is clear, that yes or no answer does not implicate the Fifth Amendment. Now, the second portion of what happened here is just what you raise. Well, why do you want that? In that sense, I don't think this case is different than other cases that this court has seen, where the defendant reinitiates the conversation or initiates further conversation, and here the officers... Would, would you agree it's reasonably likely that when, some, when the cops ask for consent to search, the defendant's going to ask why? I think it's reasonably likely, both in the context of a consent to search and in the execution of a search warrant. That's reasonably likely, and isn't it reasonably likely then that the police are going to explain and elicit yet another response from the defendant? I, it, certainly they may. So particularly in this context, reasonably likely? it's reasonably likely. It, that, that it's certainly not out of the ordinary that either of those things would happen. Again, so it's reasonably what, likely the defendant will ask the question, why? It's reasonably likely the police will respond. Then the last step, isn't it reasonably likely that the defendant is going to say something about that? I would say no to that one. So there are two reasons why, even if we uh, go down the path of reasonably likely in terms of the response, from the defendant to the question, will you consent, or I'm here to execute a search warrant, and the, ex the truthful explanation is this is why we want to use it. Number one, I don't think it follows that a defendant, particularly this defendant, is going to then say, well, I'm going to concede then. Having, he knows how to uh, invoke his right to silence. I don't think it's reasonable to assume either for the defendant or for the officers when they're asking the question on either side of the ledger that the defender is now going to blurt out something. Second of all, um, have, in the context of this case, officers have already gone over the consent advisory in terms of the search. And here, the, the appellant makes no claim that there was any coercive atmosphere or any threats or coercion or pressure to get him to consent to the search. So it's difficult to assume that there is no coercive atmosphere for purposes of the Fourth Amendment, but there is a coercive atmosphere for the purposes of Fifth Amendment. I don't think that follows in this case. Second part of that, why I think it falls apart at... Counsel, as Mr. Butler responded to me when I was asking him about the consent form, the consent form really isn't a substitute for Miranda. It doesn't tell him that anything you say may be used against you, and this DNA that we're collecting, if it turns out, you know, it matches the gun, you know, we're 
you're in trouble. It, it, do, it doesn't tell him any of that. And Correct. so it, it, it still seems to me that um, it's likely that defendants not knowing that, not knowing that uh, what I say might be used against, against me, might further do exactly what Mr. Heinonen uh, did here. The difference here, Your Honor, though, is that Mr. Heinonen knows that because he has previously been warned. This is not an unwarned statement. He was previously given Miranda. So I come back to my original point where it's not an unwarned statement, but is it a reapproach for interrogation? Is the request interrogation? And if it's not, then there is no need to issue another Miranda warning. My point about the consent advisory is the coercive atmosphere in response to Justice Lillehog's question is, isn't it likely that he's going to blurt out something incriminating? Well, part of the test that this court has adopted in Tibiotowski is we look at the totality of the circumstances. And here, because there is no coercive atmosphere for what I would argue is the more important Fourth Amendment issue in terms of the defendant's position at that point, whether he wants to give up his DNA or not. Because the defendant's mind, he knows whether or not he's touched that gun. He knows whether that DNA evidence may uh, incriminate him or exonerate him. The police don't know that. The defendant does. So if he's not coerced to give the consent for that, I don't think he can be coerced to, to then blurt out uh, an incriminating statement. Counsel, I wonder if, assuming the facts are as we have them here, no hypotheticals, just they are what they are, I'm wondering if there's a difference between the, D the DNA on the gun and the statement. Um, is there an argument here that the statement might not be admissible even if the DNA is? I, I think so, and that gets to the, uh, what essentially is a fruit of the poisonous tree argument and the relief requested by the appellant here. So if we were to assume, I'll make a hypothetical, if we were to assume that the court um, <laughs> finds that the request for consent to DNA or the later statement about what we're, truthful statement about what we're going to do with it was some form of interrogation, then yes, perhaps the statement of I touch the gun should be excluded. I would concede that. But the DNA itself isn't excluded for several reasons. Number one, the Supreme Court has made clear in Patain, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but Patain, um, that physical evidence obtained as a result of a Miranda violation based on a voluntary statement uh, is not suppressed. That's, the Supreme Court has been consistent about that for, in several cases, including Elstad. Second of all... But counsel, just to stop you right there, are you, are you saying that this wasn't coerced because he signed the consent form? Is that part of it? There's no claim, Your <clears throat> Honor, that the DNA was involuntarily given. There's no claim that there was any coercion in an attempt to get appellant to consent to the DNA swab. So if we take it a step further, the admission of the DNA at trial violates no constitutional right because the DNA itself is not testimonial communication for purposes of the Fifth Amendment, so there's no Fifth Amendment violation. And the search was proper, as appellant concedes, so there's no Fourth Amendment violation, so there's no reason to exclude. And let's assume that the DNA itself, the evidence itself, um, is not suppressed, but that the statement is. Isn't Mr. Butler's client entitled to a new trial then? I don't think so at that point, because the DNA evidence, along with uh, the remaining evidence about where uh, Mr. Heinen came from in the room, where the gun was found, where the ammunition was found, I'm sorry, in the house, where uh, his personal belongings were, is so overwhelming in this case. Harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. Harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. What, if, if I could back up in one more point on that, the other reason why I don't think a fruit of the poisonous tree argument works here is that, frankly, the DNA was not obtained as a result of the statement, I touched the gun. These are really independent pieces of evidence. Will you consent? Yes, I give my consent freely. The conversation that follows leads to the complaint of, of admission. 
but the DNA evidence is not obtained as a result of that admission. Counsel, I, I, I wonder, though, how, how, if we could really say how harmless this, this was, whether it was harmless beyond a reasonable doubt, given the, the heavy reliance uh, by the state at trial on his, on his statement by at least two of the witnesses I know. And as I recall from the record, there was at least some question from the expert about um, the reliability. I think ultimately she testifies that, that it, it's clear that Mr. Heinen touched the gun, but, but it, wasn't, it certainly wasn't unequivocal. I, I disagree, Your Honor, slightly about the record. The statements about the admission, I would characterize them almost as an afterthought. Clearly it's important. Uh, in this case, but there was not a lot of time spent on it. The vast majority of trial was spent on the DNA. Um, second of all, the officers were frankly effectively cross-examined on the admission itself. The admission did not play a large role in the state's case. The DNA evidence, on the other hand, and the remaining circumstantial evidence about where the gun was found in an area of the house under the control of appellant was overwhelming, frankly. And because of that, it, it would have been harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, but isn't the statement really the only direct evidence in the case that he touched that gun? I mean, the rest is circumstantial evidence. And traditionally, well, I don't want to get into the direct versus circumstantial evidence thing, but defense counsel could argue, oh, it's, it's merely circumstantial. There, there are many possible explanations as to how that DNA could have gotten on the gun if it was genuine DNA. Well, I, I think the DNA uh, is direct. I think it's overwhelming in this case. I think the, the vast weight of the evidence goes to show that he had control over that gun. You're saying that... Um, Matching up a DNA sample is direct well, evidence? Or I thought it was not, circumstantial no. evidence. Yeah, There's I, an inference I, that needs to be drawn. I, yes, and, and I apologize. I'm, I'm misspeaking here. I, I'm focusing more on the overwhelming weight of, of the evidence, the it DNA evidence. circumstantial evidence, but really good circumstantial evidence? Is that what really you're saying? Really good and really overwhelming circumstantial evidence, Your Honor. So I see my time's almost up. I, Oh, I'm sorry, that there was a question. I want to go back to this fundamental question about whether the approach is interrogation, because I think that's the key to this case. If it's not interrogation, then officers are free to approach a defendant. The remaining statements were really initiated by the appellant himself and the officer's truthful statement about how their DNA would be used and why they wanted it is not interrogation for purposes of Miranda. As I was saying earlier, in that sense, this case is not different from, say, State v. Paul. In that case, after uh, the defendant had invoked his right to silence, officers said, well, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to take you to jail because there's a warrant out for your arrest. The follow-up question was, well, what about, what's this warrant? I don't know anything about it. The truthful response to that question, this court found, was initiated by the appellant, and so there was no Mosley violation. I would analogize that to this case here. And it was not deemed to be reasonably likely that the defendant in that case would make an admission. Counsel, um, one of the bases of the Court of Appeals decision was that uh, taking a DNA sample is normally attendant to arrest in custody or similar to those things. I, I don't hear you making that, um, that claim here today in your oral argument. I think it was in your brief. Uh, does the record support that? Is the state actually making that argument here? It, it's, it's becoming more and more... Um, a routine part of booking. And as Amicus points out, it's routinely done for offenders. So in the context... But Minnesota the, has no law that allows police officers or booking agents to do that right away for any subset of subs suspects or even all suspects. Correct. My understanding is that's where things are moving nationally, but Minnesota does not have that right now. But my, my point would be when we look at DNA 
we have to look at DNA in the context of a fingerprint, in the same light as a fingerprint, in the same light of a handwriting example. So you're making an analogy. Yes. It's not part of the booking process in Minnesota, but it's so similar that it m might as well be considered it. Yes. Okay. It's simply identifying information. <clears throat> And so for all those reasons, and because uh, the, the, what the officers did here was in no way coercive, because there is no indication of police misconduct that should be addressed here, because this is nothing more than a routine inquiry as part of a case and non-interrogative, we'd ask that the court affirm the Court of Appeals. Thank, Thank you, you, counsel. Mr. Butler, you have five minutes for rebuttal. Mm -hmm. Mr. Butler, before you get into the substance of the argument, we've, we've had an exchange about Miranda, and I want to, you know, I, I looked up Miranda. Miranda is, is, is you know, sort of achieved uh, almost the magic word status, right? You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to a lawyer. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. The problem I'm having is when I read the Miranda warnings, it doesn't have anything to do with what the police did in this case. If they would have re-Mirandized the defendant or the suspect, um, I think it, it, it might have been just as likely for him to say, well, do I have the right to refuse this because of my right to silence? Do I have the right to, to not, conduct, not be part of this search and have the DNA swab? Or can I talk to my lawyer about this? And then they get into a substantive discussion. So in some ways, Miranda might have made the situation worse. What's your response to that? Your Honor, my response is that this isn't just a Miranda case. It's also a Fifth Amendment case. So the police here didn't just violate Miranda, they also violated the Fifth Amendment because once the defendant invokes his right to silence, that brings in not just the protections of Miranda that are constitutionalized under Dickerson um, as part of the federal constitution, but it invokes the, the Fifth Amendment. And the Fifth Amendment protects the defendant not just against talking, but it also protects against the introduction at trial of physical evidence derived from a compelled statement. So not just his statements, but any other, that's Hubble um, and Castigar and, and a case that this court decided in the 60s called King, talks about that. And so the, 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 the fruit of the poisonous tree analysis doesn't exactly work, but uh, physical evidence, derivative evidence from a Fifth Amendment violation statement cannot come in at the, at the that's trial. That's true, but the, the problem I'm having with the argument is the Miranda warning is designed, one of the designs of it is to protect the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, the privilege against self-incrimination, and the problem I'm having is it doesn't really apply to what the police wanted to do in this case. And to me, that suggests that we don't have interrogation, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a warning that is designed to protect the Fifth Amendment mm -hmm. and has nothing to do with what happened in this case, maybe it's not interrogation. I wonder what your response Responses to that. My response, Your Honor, is I, I, it is interrogation, and it is for a couple of different reasons. I wanted to start with this coercion idea, because counsel said a couple times that we weren't claiming that there was coercion here, and that's not true. This situation, we're not claiming Fourth Amendment coercion. That's true. But what Miranda recognizes is that there is always coercion inherent in any exchange between an arrested person and law enforcement when the person is in custody in a jail cell. That is the, exactly the type of coercion that the Fifth Amendment is designed to deal with. In this case, we actually have double coercion. Because not only do we have the inherent coercion of the jail cell, we have the coercion inherent upon a person who has told the police he doesn't want to talk to them. And that same police officer, and yes, Justice Lillehug, it matters that it's the same police officer, the same police officer coming back two hours later to talk to him about the case. That implies, like I said at the end of my, my main remarks, that they're not listening to him. We're not listening to him when he's told them to leave him alone. And that itself is coercive. And that is the kind of coercion that the Fifth Amendment and Miranda uh, are designed to protect against. And so the statement of, yes, I will give you consent, uh, may not be coerced under the Fourth Amendment because this case isn't a Fourth Amendment case. It's a Mosley-Miranda Fifth Amendment case. And the inquiry there is slightly different. The inquiry is the scrupulously honored inquiry. And Mosley is a case about the Fifth Amendment, not just Miranda. So when you're looking to see whether there's a Mosley violation, what courts look at is, was there a Fifth Amendment violation? 
Church, though, aren't they, isn't this really a Fourth Amendment case? I understand that there's spoken word, but doesn't that really, that and Miranda, doesn't that really suggest this, of, this should be analyzed under the Fourth, not the Fifth Amendment? No, Your Honor, I think in, in, in either way, it probably could be honored, it could, probably could have been honored under, excuse me, argued under either or both. But because you have a person who's invoked his right to silence, um, and the police have reapproached that person and talked to him, and gotten him to say something, yes, I will, that is a Fifth Amendment issue. And that's why we're here under the Fifth Amendment. Counsel, could you make your best argument that if we hold that the um, DNA evidence could be admitted, but that this, your client's statement could not, that that was not, the admission of that statement was not harmless beyond reasonable doubt? Sure. The admission of my client's statement is a confession to the crime. There's no way to argue around that statement. There are ways to argue around, as you alluded to, um, the DNA evidence. It was either contaminated or cross-contaminated. Uh, it was in a closet with a bunch of other stuff. The police did it. The lab planted it. The lab isn't certified right. There's no way to argue around my client's confession. And in the Chavara Cruz case, which I apologize, is not cited in the briefs because I, I didn't know this would come up. Chavara Cruz case, this court held, had little trouble holding that when, when a confession is wrongly admitted, really, really tough to find it's harmless beyond a reasonable doubt, even when there is ample other evidence of the defendant's involvement. And so the question you have to ask yourself, remember, is not about whether the evidence is sufficient to support the conviction or whether uh, you know, circumstantial evidence eliminates any other possibility. It is the impact of the confession and whether that was harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. And you cannot overstate the impact of a confession by a criminal defendant, yes, I committed the charged offense. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, Counsel. Thanks to both Counsel for the help that you provided to the court in this case. This matter is submitted. We'll issue an opinion in due course. We're going to recess the court now, um, and we'll go off stage and take off our robes, and then we'll come back out and talk with the students. But before we leave, I would just like to ask everybody to join me in thanking the attorneys for coming on this road show with us. Thank you so much, Counsel. All right, counsel, I think you've been with us on the road before, so you know that we're going to talk with the students now. You're welcome to, to attend and listen to that Q&A, but you're certainly not obligated or expected to. So if you want to get on the road, that's fine with us. Uh, all right, we're going to step off the stage now and take off our robes, and we'll be back with the students in a few minutes. Uh, excuse me one moment if I could have your attention. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for being an attentive audience uh, during the deliberation. It's much appreciated. If I could have uh, the persons who have been uh, volunteered to ask the justices uh, questions to come up to the front here now, please. Just a reminder to those asking questions, uh, you cannot, again, ask questions pertaining to the case. So, again, those that are asking questions from our, our government class, please come up here, please. Yeah. No, you're, you can stay here. The other side. Just come to here, but with your... Just, they want you to line up here.
will be fine. All right. All right, we need to have you settle down. We're going to reconvene here for a minute. Um, the justices indicated they're out in the other room taking their robes off. Normally, when they're done with an argument like this, they would be back talking about the case and even maybe deciding the case. Obviously, because they're in the high school, they are not doing that now. They're going to come back out here and answer some questions. Um, a couple additional thank yous. Uh, Principal Duenhager, Ms. Jens, Mr. Albers, Mr. Sandstead, Mr. Brezina, um, Chamber of Commerce, um, Tara Bitson, Alexandria Police Officers and the Douglas County Sheriff's Department have been helpful throughout this process. Several attorneys have been helping out, Ms. Schultz from the City Attorney's Office, uh, Court Administrator Bott, and uh, my law clerk, Elizabeth Gita, who has um, organized the attorneys to come and visit with you last week. In the audience, we also have school board members. We appreciate Ms. Urban from the Tech School um, and uh, certainly appreciative of the VFW providing the flag bearers this morning. Um, this is where your opportunity comes to ask questions. I know that you, some of you have been designated. This is a rare opportunity. The justices will sit up here and answer your questions. Remember, they cannot answer questions about what you just heard. 
they are still deciding that case. It would be improper for them to answer those questions. There are certain ethical rules that mean they can't do that. So please do not ask them questions about this case. Um, they must remain neutral, and if they were to talk about the case with you today, that wouldn't be neutral. Um, you can ask about procedure. Why did one uh, attorney get additional five minutes? Those sorts of kind uh, questions would be appropriate, and those are all set by rules. So rule, questions about procedure, their backgrounds, those are all acceptable. So we'll have the justices come out and um, retake the stage, and you can ask your questions. Okay, we're back. Look, and they're already lining up for questions. How awesome is that? Okay, so um, we're going to just briefly introduce ourselves to you, and then we'll take questions from the student audience. First, I just want to thank everybody involved in getting us here. And you guys were a great audience so far. You've been really good. So we're grateful. And we should applaud you. Well done. You can applaud, too. <laughs> All right, so I'm Lori Gilday. I'm the Chief Justice. I grew up in Plummer, Minnesota, population 292. It's up near Thief River Falls. Uh, I went to college at the University of Minnesota Morris, uh, law school at Georgetown. I was a lawyer for about 20 years doing courtroom stuff before I became a judge. Uh, I started on the court in January of 2006, and I became Chief Justice in July of 2010. Justice Anderson. It's great to be with everyone here at uh, Alexandria High School. I am a um, son of Mankato, Minnesota. I graduated from high school there, went to Gustavus Adolphus College, then went to the University of Minnesota Law School. I spent most of my practice life as a practicing lawyer in um, what we would call Greater Minnesota. I was first in Fairmont and then in Hutchinson. Went to the Court of Appeals in 1998 uh, and then to the Minnesota Supreme Court in 2004. Thrilled to be here and looking forward to visiting with you. Good morning. I'm David Strauss. Um, I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, spent most of my childhood in Kansas, went to the University of Kansas uh, for undergrad and for law school. Um, I also, um, after law school, spent some time clerking uh, for judges, basically being an assistant uh, and helping judges with their work. Um, and I came, eventually came to Minnesota in 2004, uh, where I was a law professor uh, at the University of Minnesota. Um, I was appointed to the Supreme Court um, in 2010, elected in 2012, and have been here ever since. Good morning. My name is David Lillehaug. I grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and went to Augustana College, where my dad was the band director. So I want to give a shout out to the, those of you in band, orchestra, and choir. I, I saw your rehearsal rooms this morning, and they're terrific. After Augustana, I went to Harvard Law School. After that, clerked for a federal judge, and then was in private practice for about 25 years. But 
For a period, um, I was United States Attorney for the District of Minnesota, the federal government's chief prosecutor in the state. I was appointed to the court by Governor Dayton in 2013 and elected in 2014, and delighted to be with you today. Good morning, I'm Natalie Hudson, and um, I'm originally from Jefferson City, Missouri, but my family moved here when I was 12, so this is pretty much home. Uh, I went to Mounds View High School. I attended Arizona State University for college and then came home and attended the University of Minnesota Law School. Uh, most of my uh, 23, 24 years of practice before becoming a judge was in what we call the public sector. Uh, the last eight years before I joined the Court of Appeals, I was at the uh, Attorney, General's, Attorney General's office doing criminal appellate work. So I was doing essentially what you saw the attorneys here doing today. And so I appeared on a fairly regular basis before the Court of Appeals and before uh, the Supreme Court. I served on the Court of Appeals for 13 years. I was appointed by Governor Ventura. And then uh, two years ago, or next week actually, uh, I was appointed by Governor Dayton to this court, to the Supreme Court, and was elected in 2016. And uh, I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Hi, my name's Margaret Chudich. Uh, I grew up in Anoka, Minnesota. I, w I went to Anoka High School, so I'm a tornado. And I went to the uh, University of Minnesota undergraduate and went away to uh, Michigan for my uh, law school uh, degree. I, um, like Justice Hudson, I worked most of my uh, career in the law in the public sector. I started off um, clerking for a federal district court judge. And then I spent some time prosecuting uh, crimes both at the state and federal level. But I also did that criminal appellate work um, that you saw the attorneys do here today. And that's when I really fell in love with uh, appellate court arguments. Um, I had the good fortune of being on the Court of Appeals for four years. That's a 19-person court that sits in panels of three, and we used to come out to the various communities to hear our cases. So if you ever want to see the Court of Appeals in action, they do come uh, near here uh, from time to time. So you can catch them, too. Uh, and then I've been on the Supreme Court a little bit over a year and a half now and really am enjoying the challenge. Good morning, good morning. Good morning way up yonder. I've been looking at you out there. How are you doing? My name is Ann McKeg. Um, I am the newest member on the court. I've been on the court for uh, just a little over a year. I am a proud descendant of the White Earth Nation. I am the first Native American female appointed to any court in the United States of America, which is a pretty good deal for the state of Minnesota. I uh, hail from the north with the chief. I am from Federal Dam, Minnesota, which is Cass County. Graduated from Reamer High School. I'm an eagle. I'm the only one who is completely color coordinated for your school today. <laughs> Just want to point that out. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, chief. <laughs> And I went to St. Catharines University after graduating from Reamer and then on to Hamlin Law School, then was an assistant Hennepin County attorney where I worked with kids who've been abused and neglected for 16 years, then moved on to the district court, and then was appointed by Governor Dayton to this court. And so we're all very grateful to be here this morning. Pay attention down here. <laughs> okay. All right, so now what happened to the students who were lined up over there? Uh, it's time for you to ask us questions. Uh, and you, get, you can come up in both lines or w whatever you want. Uh, go ahead. Good morning, Justices. Thank you for this wonderful experience. Um, my question is, what advice do you have for prospective law students? So the question is, what advice do we have for prospective law students? Uh, it's really boring uh, advice, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you nonetheless, and that is um, be a good student. I mean, the reality is the work that we do, not only as the work that we do, not only as justices on our court or as judges in the, in the Minnesota judicial system or as lawyers who appear in front of um, uh, the courts of Minnesota, is that we focus on reading and writing skills. Um, there's just no substitute for reading widely, 
learning how to write well, learning how to communicate well, um, wide life experiences, wide kind of many different types of jobs are always helpful. Um, there is no secret route. There is no one path uh, to a successful career as a lawyer or a law school student. Lots of different ways to get there. In my era, many were political science and history majors. Uh, that was my background. Uh, now I think law schools are looking for you know different kinds of backgrounds, but even then, um, many of my colleagues came from a wide variety of backgrounds. So I, I don't think there's any secret path, but there is no substitute for strong academic skills. Thank you. Next question, and then I'll go over here. So um, I just want you to share briefly what the process for becoming a justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court is. Justice Strauss, we, we answer questions in order of seniority, so we answer them in order. Go ahead, Justice Strauss. So there's, there's really two ways you can become a justice on the, on the Minnesota Supreme Court. The Constitution provides for election, which is why I said, you know, I was appointed to the court in 2010 and elected in 2012. And if there's an open seat, um, then you can be, as long as you're a lawyer, you can be directly elected uh, by the people of Minnesota through a, a regular statewide election. The other way, um, and, and probably the more common recently, um, is when there's a vacancy and there's no election uh, coming up, um, then the governor uh, appoints um, the justices. So uh, when, you know, when, when, when someone leaves, you, you still need seven justices. I mean, we, we need an odd number of justices and we're set up for seven. And so when someone leaves, uh, we need the governor to make a replacement. And so the governor will interview various candidates and, uh, and make an appointment uh, uh, to serve for a couple of years. Yes. All right. Um, how much do the cases brought to your court affect our daily lives? Justice Lulhog. Well, the majority of cases that we handle are criminal cases. And how criminal cases are handled are very important to society as a whole, notwithstanding the fact that most of you presumably are law-abiding citizens. We need to make sure that, that crime is prosecuted effectively and fairly and constitutionally. And we need to stand up for the presumption that you're innocent of a crime unless and until you're proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Because the law protects not only innocent people, but it protects guilty people. We also handle civil cases of all kinds. Think about all the ways in which the civil law can affect your life. You get married, maybe you need to get divorced. Maybe you want your name changed. Maybe you want to adopt a child. Your parents die and they need a will to be probated. Or you're, you're working for a business and the business gets in a dispute with another business. All these things in the court affect your daily lives. We have about 1.3 million cases in Minnesota's court system every year. And that's affecting a lot of people. Right here. Have you ever been indecisive on a case before? Justice Hudson, it's your turn. Um, yes, frankly, you don't want to admit that as a judge, but um, I, I think you will find that by, our, by nature, we tend to be decisive individuals because you, you have to ultimately decide. But by the same token, the cases that we hear are very, very difficult. They're, they're complex. And almost uh, by, uh, by nature uh, and by design, the cases that we get, there's two sides. Um, and that's why, they're, that's why we have them. That's why they've made their, their way to the Supreme Court, is that these are complex cases. And there are good arguments to be made on both sides uh, of, of, the, of the argument. And so sometimes, as a judge, you, you have to work your way through that. And ultimately, you have to reach a decision. But I don't think uh, any of us would be honest if we ever said we never questioned our original thought about a case or uh, 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 and I, and I think as well, one of the benefits of a collegial and a collaborative body like this one, where you have the benefit of six other very smart people, is we talk about the cases. And we, as the chief said last night, when we're in conference, it's an opportunity to think out loud and to, to share, well, you know, I'm, I'm unsure about this, or I'd like to hear from the rest of you about this point or that point, or here's where I am. So it's a process. And ultimately, as you go through that process, you do reach a decision. Um, and, and I think that's how it should be. Over here. How do you remain unbiased before hearing both arguments of a case? 
Justice Tudich. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I try to keep a really open mind, and it starts when I first read the materials. I go first to the, um, the person who's seeking relief from our court. I don't look at the bench memo that our clerks do to tell us you know, what they think. I want to have the best shot at having an open mind before I read the appellants, the person who's coming to our court, before I read their brief. Um, and it's very interesting, as Justice Hudson said, these are close cases. So I find a lot of times I'm reading the appellate's brief and I'm going, mm-hmm, that makes sense, yep, I can see that. Then I open up the other side's brief and I, and I read that and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, they got a good point here, yep, uh-huh. And then you have one more shot at the, um, there's a reply brief usually um, that the person who's, seek, who's brought the case to us gets to have the last word because they're trying to overturn something that happened before and so they have that last shot and a lot of times on those close cases I'm thinking well that's a really good point too so in many of these cases I don't have any trouble coming to them I, I try not to come to them with any preconceived notion and I try to come to them you know just uh, with a with an open mind toward what the parties are saying I, I do say in um, criminal cases, I do take an additional step where um, sometimes you can tell from the name of the person what their race might be. But if I can't tell from the names, I never look at pictures of the defendants, especially I never look at their booking pictures, which are usually very terrible pictures. Um, so I just want to, I want to keep my mind as uncluttered from any um, you know, any preconceived notions as I can. Over here. Um, I know Attorney General Lori Swanson has kind of addressed this before, but how would you guys kind of address um, President Trump's travel bans and the constitutionality of them? And then if they're perceived as maybe unconstitutional, how would you describe states' rights to overturn them and courts' rights to overturn them? I'll take that question. So as members of the court, I mean, it's a great question, and it's it's... It's an issue that's in the news a lot. Um, as your question suggests, it's a question of federal law. Um, and we do on our court from time to time get cases that involve issues of federal law. Um, and as justices and judges, um, we have an obligation to judge each case fairly and honestly based on the materials that are given to us, as Justice Chudich was just describing the process she follows, to make sure that she keeps an open mind um, about the cases as they come to us. And if we can't keep an open mind, or if someone has a reason to wonder about our ability to be fair and impartial or keep an open mind, then we have an obligation to get off the case, to not sit on the case. So if I were, as a justice of the court, to come to an audience and talk about how I might rule on the constitutionality of a, a, a law, um, then I think somebody could reasonably wonder well, is she going to be fair now when I bring that case? Because, I mean, let's just say the case involves the constitutionality of widgets. I don't even know what a widget is, but back in my day, that was what we always talked about in economics. You were always making widgets. So if I'm giving, you ask me about the constitutionality of widgets, and I tell you what I think, and I tell you I think those are the worst things that have ever been invented, and they're unconstitutional under the Due Process Clause. Then fast forward a couple years, and there's a case in front of the court involving widgets. So people are going to wonder, well, how can she fairly judge that case about widgets? Because she was in Alexandria, and she told us she thought they were unconstitutional. So that's kind of a long way, maybe a really long way, of telling you we can't answer your question. Because, because to do so would impact our ability to fairly and impartially judge cases that might come before the court. Over here. Has any particular case left a large impact on your life, and if so, how? Justice McKig. Well, certainly, um, I'm sure we all can think of a case, and for me, it was when I was a district court judge because, or before that even, it was when I was a county attorney um, and was removing kids who were abused and neglected. I mean, I remember pretty much all of those cases because it's such an important issue to make sure that kids are safe, that they are not um, removed from their families when they don't need to be, 
They're very sad stories. Um, it involves a lot of historical trauma in the families. And in fact, last week we did a listening session where some of the judges went out to the Native community and listened to people uh, in the community. And there was a young woman there. And she said, I know you. And for us, we are like that. You never know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I said, oh, oh. And she said, you removed me from my mom. And I said, oh. And I'm thinking, where's the exits? Mm -hmm. And then she said, um, and my mom says hi. And I said, OK. She came back to me about a half hour later, and she said, um, and my mom wants you to know that she's been sober for 19 years. And I said, well, tell your mom that I'm proud of her, and congratulations. But I knew exactly who her mother was, and I remembered this now adult woman as a child. And that certainly has impacted me as I have gone through my career. And I am sure that all of us have a story like that. Over, yes, go ahead. How do you cope with difficult cases that you can't talk about? Justice Anderson. That's a really good question. One of the, one of the issue, one of the, I shouldn't say issues, but one of the differences between the Court of Appeals where I served before and the Minnesota Supreme Court where I began serving in 2004 is that our most serious criminal violations, first degree murder cases, go directly to the Supreme Court. I had done prosecution work, defense work, I'd been on the Court of Appeals, et cetera. I didn't have a lot of experience with, with those first degree murder cases. And um, they are very, very difficult for some of the same reasons that Justice McKay suggests. I mean, they involve uh, just tragic, awful circumstances. And there is a tendency to take that home with you, and you have to kind of fight that tendency, and you have to you have to try to build some walls between uh, your personal life and your professional life. It's not always an easy thing to do, and I th and I I think that one of the interesting things about that experience is it has given me a tremendous appreciation for our hardworking district court judges who deal with those kinds of cases uh, in some of our busiest courts on a daily basis, and they face. The, the direct emotional trauma of those tragedies, um, and that's m a much more significant, challenging set of circumstances than my work as an appellate judge. We're removed. We're looking at, we're looking at a paper record, a report of what happened, and even that is a, a traumatic uh, experience. But you talk to people who are first responders, police officers. Uh, lawyers representing both plaintiff and defendants, or representing both the state and, and the defendant, and the district court judges who see those things. I, I think that's the most difficult part of, of uh, the legal experience, uh, not just for judges, but for lawyers as well. And there is no easy way to, to talk about how you do that. Uh, and for some of us, I think, um, you know, uh, uh, there's a reason why folks sometimes move on to other jobs because of, uh, because of those difficulties. Yes. What's the longest amount of time it has taken you to come to a conclusion on a case? Justice Ross. So, um, you know, in terms of the, in terms of the process, um, you know, that's sort of a multifaceted question, to be honest with you, and I'll tell you why. Because what you saw today was the oral argument. And in some cases, um, because we've had briefs, which, um, you know, are the written product that the, that the sides submit, and I think uh, others have, have already talked about that in response, Sometimes we've already sort of made a tentative conclusion by the time we get to oral argument. Uh, sometimes not. Sometimes we, we come in with a completely, we haven't even, you know, we, we're not even leaning one way or the other. Um, but then after oral argument, we meet in our, in our conference room, and all seven of us meet, you know, right after oral argument's over, and we talk about the case. And each, each person has a chance to say whatever they want to say without you hopefully being interrupted. And... Um, and at that point, we have to state our position on the case. And so usually, not always, but usually we will have made up at least a tentative conclusion by the time of conference. Um, and then we write an opinion, and the opinion circulates among all of us. And occasionally, not very often, but occasionally, one or more of us may change our mind. And, uh, and the case could flip, right? It comes out the other way because we decide the case can't write the way we thought it should write. Um, and so um, sometimes it takes all the way through the opinion writing process until it circulates for us to make up our mind. Sometimes we're unanimous going into conference and that unanimity 
ends up carrying through and the, and the case is over. So the answer is it really depends, and it depends on what stage you're talking about. Um, but certainly by the time the, the case is released, we've made up our mind. But that can take, you know, in really hard cases and when there's multiple opinions, that can take months to even a year sometimes. We don't like for that to happen, but it's occasionally happened. And so we want to get it right. That's the most important thing. We'd like to do it quickly, but we'd also like to get it right because, uh, because we're the last word on a lot of these issues. Yeah. <clears throat> Following the events in Las Vegas, um, I know, or do you believe the Constitution should change with time? I know there's a Second Amendment. Um, I believe that's a, the right one that deals with gun laws. Uh, what is your opinion on that? So that's, I'm going to take that. That's kind of a widget question. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so we're really not going to weigh in on a substantive area of law that might come before the court. And I, I, you know, it's not wrong to ask us these questions. Nobody should feel bad because you ask a question and we say, well, you know, we really can't answer that. That happens all the time and it's, it's not a big deal. And it really is good for us because it gives us a chance to talk a little bit more about the role of a judge and the steps that we have to take to make sure that we can fulfill our constitutional obligation to sit and decide cases in a fair and impartial manner. And so we can't weigh in and tell you, you know, how we would rule or what we think about an issue that might come before the court. But thanks for the question. Yes, sir. What do you find most enjoyable about your job? Well, I, what I find most enjoyable and yet most stomach churning is the responsibility. I remember when I was a lawyer in private practice, I would sometimes cite Minnesota Supreme Court cases from like 1880, 1905, because if it's good law then, and it hasn't been overruled by the legislature, it's good law now. In other words, our cases, are, are, our decisions are designed not just for today or tomorrow, but for 10 years from now, 50, maybe even 100 years from now. That's the part of the job that I like the most. I like the idea that when we're working very hard on a case, if we do it the right way, it will be a durable rule of law. And then some lawyer, maybe 70, 80 years down the road, will say, I don't know who this Lillehaug is who wrote the decision, but it's a clear decision. It tells me what I need to know, and it's a good rule of law for the state of Minnesota. So it's that responsibility to do what's right, not just for today or tomorrow, but even maybe 100 years down the road, that, uh, that uh, responsibility to be a public service that I find most enjoyable. Yes, sir. Um, in the area of hate crimes, what are some of the issues in balancing free speech rights against the need to control offensive activity? Well, that's kind of a widgets question again. Um, so often in our jurisprudence, though, we do have balancing. I mean, when you think about the justice system itself and the scales of justice, that's the point of the symbol, is that we're balancing Sometimes it's rights of two, of two different people were balancing the rights. Sometimes it's balancing this principle of law versus that principle of law. That's very much a part of what we do um, as, as justices and judges in Minnesota. Yes. What is the preparation like for cases you're going to hear? Justice Hudson. Uh, it's quite detailed, actually. Um, Justice Tudich alluded to a little bit of it, but I'll tell you what I do, and I think it's, it's pretty typical for most of the justices and most judges. Um, as has been indicated, uh, we get written briefs from the parties, and so we, we know what their, in, in their briefs what their arguments are. And as the chief alluded to as, as well last night, I don't know why we call them brief, because they usually aren't brief. They're usually 30, 40 pages. Um, and so the first thing we do is we, we read the party's briefs. Uh, for myself, actually, before I even turn to the briefs, I will look at uh, the, the lower court's opinion. Um, so I'll look at the Court of Appeals' opinion, because many of our cases are coming from the Court of Appeals. Um, and I'll also look at what the district court said and what, what the district court thought was the correct result. And the reason that I do that is because I know that those are the only neutral voices about this issue that I'm going to find because the attorneys are advocates for their respective clients. And so they're going to argue it from their client's perspective and they, want, they both want to prevail. 
but I like to know what did the district court judge think and how did he or she reason this matter out? And likewise, what did the Court of Appeals think? So I'll start there and read those opinions. Um, and then it depends on the nature of the dispute. If it's a contract dispute, I'll go read the contract that's at issue. Um, if it's a criminal case and, and it involves a, a particular uh, discourse or a colloquy, as we call it, between the defendant and the, the officer, I'll go read the trial transcript and read that, that, that part of it for myself. Or if it has to do with something the attorney said or didn't say, I'll read that. And then I'll turn to the briefs. And um, I typically read the appellant's brief first, the one who is appealing. Uh, and then I'll read the respondent's brief and then go back to if there's any reply brief. Uh, as Justice Chudich alluded to, we also have a bench memoranda that our clerks prepare. Sometimes I read those first uh, so that I get kind of an overview of at least what my clerk thinks are the key issues and where the fault lines, as we call them, are and what, the, you know, what I need to be on the lookout for. And so it's an extensive process. And um, depending on the number of issues in a case and the complexity of the issues, that preparation can take anywhere from you know, two or three days to a week. Um, because as Justice Strauss said, we want to get it right. And to get it right, part of that is the preparation piece of it. And that's something, like a lot of jobs, you know, people don't see what you do before you come here. And um, so there's a lot of preparation that we each have done. Uh, so for instance, in today's case, to be able to listen to this case in a knowledgeable way, we have to have done our, our homework beforehand. And so that's typically what we do. Go ahead. Who are your judicial role models and why? Um, my, <clears throat> thank you. My judicial role model <clears throat> was the district court, the federal district court judge who I clerked for. Her name is Diana Murphy. And actually, she was the first woman on the federal district court here in Minnesota. And she was the first woman on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's the eight groups of states that uh, Minnesota basically runs down to Arkansas, includes uh, North and South Dakota. <clears throat> and what I loved about Judge Murphy was, first of all, um, she was really patient with um, the lawyers and the people who appeared in front of her um, in these cases. And she was very courteous to the people who appeared in front of her, to the attorneys. Um, and she was, um, she asked really good questions. She was really smart. Um, we would get stacks of materials and I would just see her, I, you know, I'd struggle to get through all of those. I was just a new lawyer. And she would just like pour through those and yet know every, every point in it. So she was just really well prepared every time that she took the bench. And then she really helped me improve my writing ability because she believed that, um, that anybody should be able to pick up this opinion and know why the court ruled the way it did, particularly for the losing party. Because if you lose a case, that's really hard. And, it, and you at least want to know that the court understood your argument, and you really want to know the reasons why the court turned down that argument. So her goal was um, that anybody could read that opinion and know that um, without consulting their lawyer. And so we wrote a really plain, tried to write in very plain English, uh, short paragraphs, tried to avoid legalese, and um, I just, I thought the whole way that she approached her job was really commendable. Over here. What would happen if you personally knew someone on a case? We would recuse, so we would take ourselves off that case. Over here. All right, so um, with all due respect to like our American justice system currently, I know there's been a lot of pushback um, regarding some of our incarceration procedures that many of these people that wind up in jails or federal prisons uh, should actually be sent to maybe some mental institutions to help them with these problems. Uh, do you have any solutions or ideas that we could maybe improve this as a nation or as a state as a whole? So um, there's a widget aspect to this question, as the chief said. Um, but there's, there are also some underlying legal issues, and I want to talk a little bit about both those things. Let me first talk about the widget aspects of this. Um, we are not in charge, as a judicial system or as judges, 
in terms, in, in, we are not in charge of deciding what a sentence should be for a particular crime in terms of what's authorized by the legislature. We may have flexibility within a range to decide, but the ultimate question of sentencing authority comes from the legislature. So if there are concerns about um, sentences that are too long or the sentences should be different for different types of crime, that's an issue that you take up with your elected officials who serve in the other two branches, the executive and the legislative branch. There is, of course, uh, an aspect. We do have questions about um, uh, prison conditions and other kinds of things that may come up from time to time that raise legal issues that we have to decide. So those may come to us in, in some context or another. We are typically not asked to set policy for um, for example, prison conditions. We may be asked in a particular case brought by a prisoner who is entitled to, he or she is entitled to have their case decided by um, a judge or if it's a jury issue as well, um, just as any other uh, resident in Minnesota would be decided, would, would be entitled. And then we'll evaluate that and make some kind of a decision. Um, again, not taking a stand on this, but if you've been following the de developments uh, with regard to our commitment procedures, you will know that there was litigation uh, that took place in the federal courts, uh, went to the uh, Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, was before the United States Supreme Court here in the last uh, week or two. The United States Supreme Court declined to take further review of it. The reason we don't comment on that is that we, have to, we may have to decide these questions. But going back to what the chief said earlier, I don't have any particular advice for you about what we should do as a, as a civilization, as a, as a, a body politic. Uh, but what I will say is these are important questions. You're right to raise them. And the place to raise them um, is in public discourse and in conversations with the elected officials who set our policies. Thank you very much. Okay. And if I would be so bold to, um, do you have any opinion on the honorary Judge Judy? I think Judge Judy is awesome. <laughs> Over here. Has, has anyone in your life influenced you or inspired you to reach where you are today? Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's been a lot of people that have inspired me over time. I don't think you get into a position uh, like this one unless there's a lot of people who helped you along the way um, in various respects. Um, certainly my family, my mother, uh, my brother, uh, my wife Heather, uh, my two kids, um, they've all inspired me uh, in a lot of different ways. You know, you, you may not think it, but if, you know, your parents are inspired by the things that you do, and I'm inspired every day by the things that my kids do. Certainly a lot of professional role models, people who have helped me along the way um, and haven't had any reason to other than out of the kindness of their heart. Um, and then people I've learned from, judges for whom I've clerked, um, who have helped me understand what the law is about, professors who spent time with me when I was in law school and sat me down in their office and we talked about a particular aspect of the law um, that I was unfamiliar with, um, colleagues uh, who you know have, have helped me understand some aspect of the law better or multiple aspects of the law better. Um, I just think that um, I personally have drawn inspiration from all of those people. Um, various types of inspiration, but inspiration from all of them. Okay, so I've been given the high sign that we can do these two questions and then, right, Lissa, where did she go? Yes, okay, we can do these two questions. Go ahead. Um, what is the measure of reasonable? I noticed you guys saying reasonably, um, reasonably likely, reasonable person, reasonable doubt. What is the measure? Justice Lilhaug. Well, I think you were referring to the argument that we just had today. Not necessarily. Just well, I know I hear it's, about. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where you might have heard it. So I'm going to declare widget. <laughs> Next question. Last question. So you said that if you have personal relations or you know somebody of which the case is about, that you'll step down from that case. How does that work if there has to be seven justices? That's a great question. Um, our rules provide for up to, f that we will never have less than five. So if we have a situation where three of us know somebody and have to get off the case, then there's only four. So what do we do then in that scenario? 
we appoint someone as an acting justice to come and sit with us so that we have five. So we don't have to have seven. I mean, the, the, we, we have seven members of the court, but we can sit with six, um, but we don't sit on cases with less than five of us. So if three of us recuse and there's only four left, then we will appoint, maybe it's a justice who's retired, who will come back and, and, and sit on the case with us so we have five. Or sometimes we bring up judges from the trial court and we have a kind of a big bingo um, ball roll thing that we, we randomly pick a judge's name out of there and then they come up and sit with us so that we have a five member court. So that's how we handle that. All right, you guys have been a great audience. I want to thank the superintendent and principal again. Good job. All right, students and staff, uh, you'll be going back to first block and be staying there till third hour, all right? So head back to first. Social studies teachers, if you have third block, you'll go to first lunch.